Okay, uh, welcome to tonight's Archaeology Cafe, um, uh, hosted by the Center for Desert Archaeology and Casa Vicente. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, the way our talks usually go is our speaker will speak for half an hour or so, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. So tonight, I'm going to turn things over to Patricia Gillen, who's going to talk about members of Mesoamerica, macaws, and women. <laughs> Um, and, and I'm hoping, since this is a, a s based on the science cafes, that you all will talk to me and me with you um, during my talk. And so Doug may want to stand by with the microphone. I don't know. Um, we'll see. Um, and, and so what I'm hoping for is some back and forth all the way through here and not just you sitting there uh, passively uh, <laughs> uh, while I'm talking. So... I want to make some connections with you tonight about Mimbris, Mesoamerica, and macaws. And apparently last spring sometime, Art Vokes came and spoke with you all and mentioned that I knew something about macaws and women. I know nothing about <laughs> macaws and women, <laughs> but Merritt Munson does. And so I will talk about macaws and women here, but it's not my research, unfortunately. I wish I could claim it, but I can't. Um, so. Um, I'm hoping you all know where Mimbris is. Let's start there. In, on your map, far southwestern New Mexico um, is where the Mimbris star is there, although you might not be able to tell that. And Mimbris is very famous, you probably know, for these beautiful, what get called naturalistic pots, bowls. Um, and I put three on the back with macaws or parrots on them. Um, because that's the theme tonight, and women, and women. And, um, and it's those beautiful bowls occur with Pueblos, with Pueblo buildings like you see here at the bottom of the handout. That's an artist's reconstruction of the Galaz site, which is actually not, my husband points out, a typical member site. It's a very important member site uh, for reasons that we may get to. It's probably one of the two ritual centers um, in the members area. So, member, member stuff is along the Mimbris River in the Mimbris region, conveniently enough. And, okay, good enough on that. So, then what is, oh, I should tell you before I get really going here and forget. This research that I'm presenting here tonight is not just mine. Um, we all work together in archaeology, and more and more we're actually thinking together and publishing together. It's not the, the, the one person anymore, um, which is a good thing. Three brains are better than one. Uh, Mark Thompson has uh, worked on this research with us. Uh, he does the iconography. He understands it much better than I do. Christina Wyckoff was one of my master's students. Uh, she did her master's degree on parrots and macaws and the members. And so it's all three of us working together here um, that did this. Can I get you to come and stand over here so the camera can see you instead of the pole? Ah, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've all got members in your heads. What is then the connection with Mesoamerica? What do you think it might be? Uh, macaws, trade. trade. We'll get back to the trade thing. Hold that thought. So scarlet macaws, specifically, we're going to be talking about tonight. What else from Mesoamerica might appear in members? You may know the answers to these things. Hmm? Chocolate, not that we know of yet. We could be hopeful, but we don't want to be just like Chaco Canyon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we don't know. Honestly, we don't know the answer to that. We don't have those um, cylindrical vessels that you see at Chaco, where the uh, cacao residue was found. And so, and those are the same kinds, more or less, of cylindrical vessels you find in Mesoamerica. We don't have anything like that. So maybe we won't find chocolate. I don't know. Keep going. What else? Pottery. pottery. We could find pottery. We don't think so, anyway, from Mesoamerica. It's a long way to haul pot. It's a long way to haul scarlet macaws, though, too, you're going to see. So one of the questions is going to be, why not pottery? Why scarlet macaws? OK, keep going. Good thoughts, good thoughts. Hmm? What feather There is that feather cloak from, what was it, a cave in Utah. Um, it has, um, it's like so, and like so, as I remember it. Scarlet macaw feathers woven into it. 
hundreds of them, hundreds of them. Um, stunningly beautiful, and it's in Utah. I, I mean, it's not exactly like it's here in Tucson or at Casas Grandes or at, in Zacatecas at La Quemada. It's in Utah. That's something I have no idea about. I mean, except that it's there and it's real. Okay, keep going. What else might we find in Mimbris that comes from Mesoamerica? Copper bells. Copper bells, yep, and we do find those. We have a handful of them, not very many. Um, and they come from the west coast of Mexico, not too far down, um, Sinaloa-ish. Um, and shell, uh, marine shell. M the vast majority of it in members comes from the Gulf of California. Um, and so those two things come from the west coast. The scarlet macaws come from the East Coast, I think, many of my colleagues disagree with me, but they're wrong. Um, <laughs> if you look here on the map, you see Huasteca marked. Um, it is the closest source of scarlet macaws to the Mimbris. It's 700 plus-ish miles from Mimbris, straight line, uh, and you wouldn't go a straight line. So it's, it's a nice hike, you know, um, but I'm going to make the case to you that it's doable. A nice hike, but doable. Um, there are macaws available on the west coast in the tropical rainforest. For scarlet macaws, you have to be in the tropical rainforest. Um, unlike military macaws, which there are a few of in the southwest, there's one at Mimbris, um, and unlike thick-billed parrots, which are much smaller, which we also find across the southwest and in Mimbris, those thick-billed parrots actually, at one point, I at the turn of the last century, lived in the Chiricahua Mountains and some other places. Um, beautiful birds, but I'm afraid long gone from this area. Um, but the scarlets come from, the closest is there in the Huasteca, they could come from the west coast. Many of my colleagues would like to say they do because I think the copper bells and the shell comes from the west coast. And so they're thinking, well, you know, if you've gone over there to get some copper bells and some shell, you might as well get some scarlet macaws while you're there, except the scarlet macaws come from farther south than that. The one thing that nobody has mentioned so far, although it goes with the pottery in Mimbris, is iconography. And I have made a case, the three of us have made a case, um, that much of the iconography on Mimbris pottery is Hero Twins iconography from Mesoamerica, although it's kind of Pan-American too. You find it lots of places in, throughout the Americas. But it appears in the Mimbris at 1000 AD-ish with the scarlet macaws. The two seem to come together, at least in time. I'm not saying, I'd like to say, but I can't, that, they, that the same people brought them up. Um, but I think it's perhaps no coincidence that the two things come together at about the same time in the members. I think that connection is very important. We'll talk some more about that. Okay, so those are the things we find in the members that we can say are from farther south, um, that we're sure of. Scarlet macaws did not fly up by themselves. Um, somebody had to bring them, and that's true of those other things as well. Okay, so let's think about scarlet macaws for a minute. Um, has anybody ever owned a scarlet macaw in here? Good. Do you? You have two. Ooh, ooh, okay. Um, my understanding of them is that they are, um, they're big. You've probably all seen them in a zoo or something. Um, they're big birds, their tail feathers which are red, um, and which is what probably people were after on these birds, are um, 12 inches long, am I right? 30. 30, okay, yeah, okay, they're big, they're big. These are beautiful birds. They've got the red, they've got blue, they've got yellow on them, they are stunning birds. Um, if you have not seen one, uh, Google it and take a look, because uh, they are just beautiful. I mentioned that here in the Southwest, people also occasionally use some military macaws, which are not, they're from the dry forests in the Sierra, farther south, 
but they're not from the rainforest, but they're not from as far away as the um, scarlets. And then the little parrots um, are green, and they're, both of those are spectacular birds, but they are not scarlet macaws. And I think the instant people got a way to get scarlet macaws from Mesoamerica, they just, I mean, the militaries and the, um, the parrots were nice. And they had a lot of them. They had a lot at Casas Grandes, for example, of militaries. Um, but they don't count when you're thinking scarlet macaw. Um, how then, we're going to get back to the trade idea, how then did people, did these macaws get up here to the members? They, they came to other places too. But how did they get it? They did not fly. Hmm? They were carried. Now, the traditional idea has been that they were traded, right? And so I would be raising scarlet macaws, or I would have caught some wild ones, and I would say to my cousin 50 miles to the north, hey, you want one of these? And my cousin would say, sure. And my cousin would take it. And then he would, being a good gift-giving person, he would say to his cousin 50 miles north, hey, take this bird. This is a great bird. You know, they talk. They talk. Boy, if you don't think that's important, not important for ritual, um, having an animal that speaks, whew, they don't all talk, but many of them do. Um, so, and so that was the idea, that you would take these birds and you would hand them off down the line, and then they would magically appear in the members or at Chaco Canyon at the same time. Um, the problem with that idea seems to be that these are nasty birds. Um, not only are they nasty, well, we had a friend, we have a friend who had, it wasn't a scarlet, it was another kind of, I think it was a blue and gold macaw, and he would give it two by fours to play with and rip apart. Do you want to be carrying one of those, you know, handing it off? Yeah. And the other thing about um, macaws is, and so what they're bringing north, we think, are the small, are the um, young birds. We don't think they're bringing adult birds north because you don't want to carry one of those uh, for 700 miles um, or even 20 miles uh, is my guess. Um, so they're bringing the young birds as soon as they can carry them. We think that's true in large part as well because most of these birds are dead, <coughs> sacrificed uh, at 11 or 12 months. They're born in March and April-ish, around the spring equinox, and then here, at, in Mimbris anyway, they are sacrificed a year later, as soon as they have the long tail feathers. Ha! Um, so you get the long tail feathers and you get a cool sacrifice as well out of the deal. <laughs> so this is a good thing. This is a good thing. So, but to bring a young bird, to carry a young bird 700 plus miles, You've got to feed it every few hours. The food has to be a certain amount. It also has to be a certain temperature, or the bird doesn't thrive. And what's the sense of getting these birds if you lose it halfway up on the trip? You know? So you really have to be careful with them. This is not a case where you can just take the young birds, toss them in a bag, and just start walking. Um, you have to know how to care for them, and you have to and you have to actually care for them um, in order to get them up here alive. And then you kill them. Um, so, okay, so that's the macaws. Let's see. So we're making the case that Mark and Christina and I, that this is not down the line trade. That somebody either went to get these birds or somebody from Mesoamerica brought the birds up. And it was the same person for the whole trip. It wasn't that they handed them off, um, because these birds apparently bond to one person uh, when they're young. And so, um, you know, you can't hand it off to your cousin. Um, okay, so, how, what if you're an archaeologist, what are you going to look for, for evidence in terms of who is bringing the macaws? Are they, is somebody from Mexico bringing them up? Or is somebody from the Mimbris going down and bringing them back? The evidence is skimpy, 
But what might you look for? Besides my wild speculation. Cages. Hmm? Cages. Cages, yeah. And I think on, do I have a cage? Yeah, there's a cage on that top. Uh, no, those are hoops. Just a second, I don't have my glasses on. Well, some of these with the parrots have cages on them. Um, but do we find those archaeologically in the Mimbris? Not like we see them at Pocky May in, because they're raising them at Pocky May. We don't think that we have no evidence that they're raising them in the Mimbris, that they're raising these birds um, in the Mimbris. So, um, the one piece of evidence that we have that I don't like, by the way, is that we, you know we've been doing stable isotope and DNA analyses of both animal bones and human bones. Um, and that's been a hot thing in archaeology for 10-ish years or so. And it turns out that there are three women <coughs> um, at the Nan Ranch site, which is one of the big classic members Pueblos, like Galaz, but not as important, um, ritually. There are three women there who are apparently from northern Mexico by these analyses. And so you might think, uh, well, first of all, what are you thinking? Did, the, did those women bring the, par the macaws up? They're from northern Mexico. They're not from the Huasteca. They're from, like, southern Chihuahua, northern Zacatecas, Durango area. They're from that area. So, um, and one of them is, they're in the members in the 900s, early 1000s. The second one is in the members in the early 1100s. So the two, those two don't overlap at all. They didn't come as a group of three. They didn't come up together. Um, but they died at the Nan Ranch site and are, were buried there. Um, so there is some indication of people coming from the south into the members. Um, but we've done so little of this that we really don't know what else there might be. Are people coming from the north and other directions? We don't know. We don't know. Um, um, and, well, no, we won't go there. Okay. Um, so one of the reasons that Mark and Christina and I like the concept, but we can't prove it, and we have no data, of people going down from the Mimbris to the Huasteca, the closest place they can go, bringing the birds back, is, has nothing to do with economics, it has nothing to do with you know, making a living, with subsistence, with food. What does it have to do with? Maybe marriage. Maybe marriage. Yeah. Um, how do you get the best marriage partner? With a dowry. With a dowry, yeah. With being an important person that somebody would want to marry, right? With having some ritual power, a little bit of religious power there. Never hurt anybody. Um, so one of the, re the, the main reason we think these birds are so important is because think about making that trip. You start out from Mimbris. How do you go? How do you know where to go? They did know where to go, I think. How do you know? Have people gone before you? Probably. I mean, somebody had to make the first trip. But I think we have this concept in our heads in Western society that folks like who lived in the Mimbris area in the past, they were just happy farmers. And they just sat there, and they farmed, and they were happy. And everything was wonderful until they starved. Um, but we don't have this idea of them moving around the landscape. And, and by moving, I don't mean 50 or 100 miles. I mean 700 plus miles. Why do people make trips on foot, carrying macaw babies? Um, why do they make those trips? Why would we make such a trip today? because people do make such trips today, on foot. Do we do it for economic reasons? No. What, do, what reasons do we do it for? Religion, that's right. We, we have something that we've promised to do, and we're going to do it. Um, and 
I don't know that these folks promised anything, but they're going to get these macaws because these macaws will be important in their religious practices. Um, what happens? So you start walking, and you're on this path, and you know where to go because people have told you what the landmarks are. Um, you walk for three days, you're going to see this flat-topped mountain off on your left, and you go to the right of it, you follow the river, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, yeah, I bet you can get lost, but um, hopefully you don't because you, you want to be successful in this. And so some months later, or a year or two later, you appear back in Mimbris with a scarlet macaw, uh, half-grown, fully grown, I don't know. Um, what is your reception going to be? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Are people going to be stunned? Yes. Yes. Now, maybe they've seen, maybe somebody five years ago brought a macaw. But still, these are magical birds. They're big, they're beautiful, they're bright, they're unlike any, they're, the coloration is unlike any bird in the Southwest. You know, we got some great birds in the Southwest, but nothing like a scarlet macaw. And they can talk. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> they're talking. Um, so... Anybody who is successful in this journey, and there certainly must have been people who weren't successful, but anybody who pulls this off is, I think, instantly going to have an important place in that society, an important place in the ritual life of that society, um, because they brought such a powerful symbol, a powerful being north with them, a being that can be sacrificed at the equinox for um, a good year, good farming, um, good, good life, fertility, those sorts of things. I don't know that that's what they were sacrificed for. But, um, but these are important birds, um, things. Um, okay. Okay. Let's talk about the women. Is that enough on that for the moment? Okay. Yeah. There is no evidence in the Mimbris that they were raising the birds. We don't have the bird cages. Do you all know Pakime, Casas Grandes, where Dr. Minis works? They have the actual bird cages uh, made of adobe. Um, and they have eggshells in them, um, as well as parrot poop. Um, and we don't, we don't find any of those cages or anything we can call a cage, and we don't find any eggshell. There is potentially one eggshell fragment thing from one of the big sites in the Mimbris. But the excavator is uncertain of that, and he's unwilling to talk about it, <laughs> therefore. So I'm not going to say his name or the name of the site. Um, so um, we don't think so. We don't think they figure out how to raise them in the north, which is not the tropical rainforest, until 1250, 1300 at the site of Pakime in northern Mexico. And what a big step that would have been to actually be able to raise these birds. There are over 400 scarlet and military macaws remains from the side of Pakime. So, okay. Other questions for the moment? Okay, let's talk about women then. If you look, if you look at the back of your sheet, you see three Three Mimbris classic bulls. Classic meaning 1,000 to 1130, when the big Pueblos were going. Um, let's look at the top one here. What do you see in that bowl? Hmm? Macaw. Well, and we don't know if they're macaws. The only way you know if, it's, if you're certain it's a scarlet macaw is scarlet macaws have a white, can't remember what it's called, patch right here around their eyes. And on a few Mimbris bowls, there are 36-ish membrous bowls that have macaws or parrots on them, we think. Um, on a few of them, they have that white spot, and so you know it's a scarlet. Um, on the rest of them, we aren't so sure. We wish we did know, but we don't. And so we see some sort of parrot-like macaws birds there, right? What else we got? Women. We got women. And how do we know they're women? Well, we know, first of all, they're women because they have breasts. But secondly, Merritt Munson, who has done the, most of the work on 
the depiction of men and women on members' pottery, Merritt Munson, so you don't think I did this, um, has pointed out that those string aprons that these two are wearing um, associate with women. Um, so we know these are women because of the presence of the string aprons. What is on their heads? Masks. They look like bird masks. Those are not their faces. They look like bird masks. And so we might even imagine that these two are doing some sort of ceremony. Maybe they're just training the macaws because they've got a hoop couple of hoops there, and they've got some sticks, and so maybe they're just training the macaws. Um, but maybe they're also doing some sort of ceremony. Um, I think the masks are pretty important. Okay, so we've got a couple women there. Look at the one in the lower left. Is that a man or a woman? woman. That's a woman because she's got the string apron. Um, and what else does she have? She's got the parrot, bird, macaw. She's got a bird in basket, yes. Um, and Mark thinks that um, these bird in baskets really symbolize both bird in baskets and burdens, that we are given duties in life, we're given burdens to carry, and that these are symbolized on members' pots. And so she has, she's carrying the macaw, now, of course, she could be just carrying it from her house to her neighbor's house, um, but maybe not. Don't know. Okay, look at the third bowl. That is actually a member's polychrome bowl um, because it has a third color. It's got a brown uh, color in one of the bodies. And what do you see there? You got a man and a woman, right? And bird masks. And bird masks, yep, yep. Um, and hoops, and burden baskets, and, and sticks, and a bow and arrow set, and all sorts of things. I mean, we can name these things, but we don't really know how important they are. Uh, are those staffs, those crooked staffs, um, a symbol of importance, of office, of duty, of something? Uh, we don't know for sure. I think they are, but we haven't quite done that study yet. I wish we had. Okay, so when you look at bowls that have both human figures and parrots of some sort, parrots, macaws, on them, Merritt Munson says, well, most of them associate with women. Most of the figures on the bowls that have parrots are women. You do have the man here. We'll get back to him um, in a minute. Um, but most of them are women. So what does this mean? Because who runs the ceremonies today in Pueblo societies? The men. The men. men. Women certainly have some things to say and have some roles that I don't understand. But they certainly have roles. Um, but the public face of those ceremonies is men, right? And so... Does this suggest that women might have some power here, some sort of status? Um, because they're dealing with these really important creatures from very far away, from exotic locales. Merritt thinks that that is exactly what's happening. She thinks that perhaps a few women who come from specific families, not any woman, you know, um, not all of us would come from the right families, but a few who would come from the specific families and perhaps at the Galaz site, which is a very important site, which is where many of these bowls and 11 of the 21, 22 parrots and macaws and the members come from. So half of them come from this site, one of the reasons we think it's an important site of many. Um, so she thinks that there may be women there from the right families who gain certain amounts of social power, of social status, of ritual power, because they're the ones who handle these birds, for the most part. Um, it's rare that you see a man depicted there. Now, okay, and she suggests that perhaps 
even, it might be that the women are going on these trips to get the birds. Wouldn't that be something? Um, I suspect they would have gone with men, perhaps in a family group or some such, in a ritual group. Um, but, and I, I remind you that the three women from northern Mexico who are at the NAN site are all women. They're not men. Not to say that they weren't men. We just don't know, but they are. I mean, clearly, women are moving around the landscape in a way that we might not have expected. They're moving long distances. They're going on these treks. They're going on these perhaps religious pilgrimages, you might think of them as. Um, I'm kind of out on a limb here, but why not? Um, OK, so let's go back to these pots. Is everything painted on these pots the way it appears? That is, we have interpreted these as women, or a woman and a man, um, doing parrot stuff. So let's take another interpretation of this. Let's take the pot in the lower right that has the woman and the man on it. Now, I mentioned the Hero Twins iconography that we see on a, that I, the three of us think we see on a lot of these members pots, right? So, um, the elder twin is depicted in Mesoamerica and in the Southwest as um, larger than the younger twin. He is right-handed, and he's depicted as a man. The younger twin is smaller, he's left-handed, and he often appears in a feminine guise. He's a man, but he often appears as a woman, or at least partly as a woman. Okay, what if we thought that this lower pot might instead of a man and a woman be the hero twins? We've got the larger, older twin. We've got the smaller, um, younger twin. And the smaller, younger twin is in a feminine guise. Um, we have no idea if this is what's being shown. But my point here is that these are not necessarily depictions of real life. These could, all of these, could be depictions, narratives from the Hero Twin Saga, from other important religious stories, um, and have nothing to do with the reality of people's everyday lives. Um, you know, making a living, having kids, raising your kids, that kind of stuff. Um, these could be strictly religious sorts of things. Um, so, we don't know the answer to that. Um, but I throw that out there because I think it's important to think about. Um, for a long time, whenever you look at members' pots, and I know most of you have probably seen them, people say, well, these are depictions of people's lives. You know, they're people hunting and they're people um, picking bugs off the corn plants, and um, they're doing this and they're doing that, and then there's the ones you can't interpret at all. Um, and those must be the ceremonial ones. Um, but I think it's possible that they're all pretty ceremonial. Um, okay, so let's do one more thing. So I've made a point that the birds themselves are important, and I want to mention Sharon McCusick's name because she has done a lot of the initial work on macaws um, and other, lots of other kinds of birds, important birds in the Southwest. And she was the one who I think initially pointed out that they're sacrificed at the spring equinox, for example. Um, okay, so we've talked about why the birds are important. Let's talk about one other thing about why this is important um, and the role that the macaws played. And this gets to that really boring question that archaeologists always ask, which is, why is this research important? I mean, why, if you didn't love Mimbrous pottery and scarlet macaws, why would you care about this if you're an archaeologist? And we hope the rest of you who aren't straight archaeologists care about this too, because it's your tax dollars, honestly. Um, so what, why would we care that either people from the Mimbrous or people from Mexico brought the scarlet macaws and perhaps the hero twins iconography and stories and saga north with them into the members. What difference does it make? 
Nobody wants to tackle that one? Oh, come on. Cultural exchange. Cultural exchange, yes. Certainly, something is coming north from Mexico, the macaws, and how to take care of them. And if you're going down there, or even if somebody's just appearing in your village, there's going to be a lot of exchange of ideas and concepts going on there, some of which you may use, some of which you may roll your eyes at. Um, keep going. What else might make this important when thinking about people in the past? Yes, um, we've got religion all around us. Um, and we know what an important factor it is in the world today. Um, and so some understanding of how people um, incorporated new ideas in the past or rejected them in the past and the lengths they went to to get things like scarlet macaws. Um, yeah, we all know how important religion is to many people in the world. And I think that 700, 14, 1500 mile round trip on which you were likely to die, honestly, um, probably shows just how important these sorts of things are. Let me give you one last thing, though, that goes along with this that I haven't told you about. In the Mimbris, in the AD 900s ish, you know, there's, they're living in pit structures, pit houses at that point. They haven't moved over to Pueblos yet. Um, and you know, at this point, they also have those great kivas, um, these huge underground buildings, which were clearly for people to get together um, and do some sort of communal activities, probably much of it religious um, ritual. Now, they had been building great kivas since at least AD 600. So for several centuries, they've been building these great kivas. They, they build them so that they can retire them, so that when the time comes that they need to decommission these buildings, they, they can collapse the walls and the roof in a certain sequence and decommission it properly. And, then, and they burn it, um, usually in a fire that, is just, that just torches it. And these are big buildings with huge timbers, and it takes a while for those fires to get going. I, you've got to work at it. You can't just, you know, toss a little ember in and think that it's going to burn like that. So um, they've been burning these, decommissioning them, and then building new ones all along over those several hundred years. In the 900s, they burn them, and they don't build new ones. So that by the time you hit 1000 AD or so, there are no great kivas out there. What does that suggest to you? Either war or famine. War or famine, something that, it could be any number of things, but those are certainly two good ones. Um, we don't have evidence for either of them at that point, but we don't have evidence for much in the 900s. So they, whatever they were doing for religion, they stopped doing it. They, they burned those buildings and, and didn't uh, redo them. Okay, so we've got some sort of religious change going on at, within a few decades, yeah, um, we see scarlet macaws, we're pretty sure of the timing, not positive yet, but we will be. Uh, we see the scarlet macaws and we see the hero twins iconography start to appear. I am bothered by those few decades. Um, I wish it was simultaneous, you know. They burn the great kivas, and then you see the scarlet macaw the next day. Um, but it doesn't work that way in archaeology. So it does look like there's some sort of religious change going on. We have no idea what that might be. Um, and we have no idea what the new religion with the scarlet macaws and the hero twins iconography really is. Did it completely replace the religion of, that was being practiced in the great kivas? We don't think so, because People were making great kivas to the north at the same time. And, um, and once Mimbris sort of falls apart in the 1130s or so, um, people make great kivas in other places. I, you know, and we see kivas today in Pueblos. Um, so that has remained an important thread of what's going on in Pueblo and religion over the last 15, 1600 years. Um, as have the importance of 
macaws and brightly feathered birds, as have um, the importance of the hero twins in Puebloan religion. Um, so there's something that happens at Mimbris. It's a momentary blip of 100, 130 years, um, maybe less. And then everybody kind of incorporates um, the change. They use the scarlet macaws. They use the hero twins. They go back to building great kivas. Everybody's happy. Um, and everything continues on into the present day. So that's my story for tonight. Thank you. Okay, as, as host, I get to ask the first question. Oh. What's the evidence for the, the sacrifice? What's the evidence that the birds are actually being physically sacrificed? Shoot. They're all dead about the same time. They're all dead about the same time, yeah. Um, I don't remember, and you know, people have not looked very carefully at these bones. Most of them, most of these macaw skeletons were excavated a long time ago. Some of them we can't find. Um, and we're working hard at that. Um, but yes, they all die <laughs> in March or April-ish. Hmm. Um, so, and, and apparently you can tell that on the bones. Okay. Um, that, that's when they died. So, and that's when <clears throat> they die today as well. Um, oh. They are, um, at least in the historic past, they were sacrificed as well on the spring equinox. Okay. And so. Next question. Okay. I want to continue with the question of, of the sacrifice. You, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that they all died approximately at the same age. In the, is it possible that they could have died from a malnutrition approximately at the same time since their, start, since their journey started at approximately the same point in their, in their development? They, de they mm -hmm. moved up to the north, yeah. and because they were fed a diet that was not rich in fruit, Right. And, and their normal native diet that they might have all expired at about the same. <laughs> I'm just being argumentative yeah. for the sake yeah. of No, it. no, no, no. That's a good point. That's a good point. Because certainly their diet wasn't <clears throat> very good, um, even, but it did keep them alive. Um, I think that would be surprising that people would go to all the effort of getting these birds in one way or the other and get them up here and then allow them to die. I would sooner think that they were sacrificed. Um, but, but I can't negate what you've said. People keep so. trying. I mean, yeah. When, when yeah. we're talking about religion, we're 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 going beyond rational. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not offending, but I mean, <laughs> there's, there's we're people, acting on faith. People tr people keep trying to do things over and over. Right. Again. Right. Right. Um, and then you could make the point that um, they succeeded at Pocky May when they started to when they learned how to raise the birds themselves. But across the Southwest, regardless of where you're looking, the vast majority of the birds, Sharma McCusick has pointed out, um, did die at 11 to 12 months. And given that they're all born in March or April, you know, it's a pretty strong pattern. Um, and I would expect it to be more varied if, um, if it were malnutrition. I'd expect some of them to die at nine months and some of them to die at 15 months. And, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay. A question here? Uh, Pat, I just want to try to understand something a little better. Overall, there are, what is it, 20 to 30 macaws from members that are known? Or the, some the, count like is, the count is currently 21, I okay. think. And this is over what period of time exactly? 1,000 to 1130. So not many. So 1,300 years. No, no, uh, 130. I'm sorry? 130 years. Oh, 130. Yeah. yeah. That, that's not but a still thousand, not very many three. birds. OK. Yeah, that's what I was trying to yeah. understand. So a very small number of birds yeah. and a fairly large number of communities. Yes, but only two communities in the Mimbris Valley, which is the I hate this word. It's the core of what's members. We're not going to talk about that tonight. Okay, um, only two sites have macaws in uh -huh. the Members Valley. Galaz, which I've made a case to you slightly, is one of the ritual centers. Old Town is the second one. It is also the second ritual center, mm -hmm. um, okay. we think. One's in the north end of the valley, one's in the south end. Um, it turns out that there's a macaw at a small site north of Galaz 
it's the only other macaw in the Mimbers Valley itself. All the other macaws are out in sites to the west of the Mimbers Valley, and there's only two or three of them. Mm -hmm. And so they're pretty concentrated in those two sites. So just two sites, but for a very short period of time. Yes, and, 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 and a few out there, and I can't explain those. Um, but I think the concentration of them is important. I think it suggests the importance of those sites and the importance of those birds at the sites. Uh, more anthropologically than archaeologically, um, do you see a parallel between the raising of Hopi young eaglets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And their sacrifice. Yes. And also the, the masked um, katsinas mm -hmm. who are male, mm -hmm. but um, imperson not impersonated. But, female, uh, have but, female but have a female guys. exterior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To them, yes. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a lot of continuities there. I mean, we all know how much continuity there is in religion. Um, in religions you may be familiar with, um, there's certainly um, many hundreds of years, thousands of years of continuity in some ways. And I think we see those in um, um, the Puebloan religion religions uh, here in the Southwest as well, and in other um, non-written religions these things being passed down orally instead of in writing. Um, yeah. Another question? She had a question. I was just wondering if the burning of the kivas would have something to do possibly with contagious disease. Huh. I don't know. That is um, because people were crammed in so closely together right. that um, there was something that went around right. and people said, Oh, no, yeah. we don't want to do that. I don't know the answer to that. There's no evidence of it, but as you know, that doesn't mean anything um, because we often don't have evidence of those kinds of things. Um, no, I just don't know the A answer A little to bit that. later in time, up around um, the Homolavi area, when they close, ceremonially closed these kivas, they burned them, and they also left a bunch of objects in them that still had a lot of, of use life left to them. Mm -hmm. So these types of deposits that get left along behind along with the burning might tend to indicate that it's more of a sacrifice than a, a, a contagion. But, yeah, well, but it's still a great idea. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, going back to the eagles, it's really hot right now in southwestern archaeology to be looking at bird bones from archaeological sites because you find all different kinds of birds. You find eagles, you find lots of kinds of hawks and owls and some small songbirds, ravens. Um, often they're big birds, but sometimes they're small birds. And um, people were clearly capturing them and using them ritually. They do today, they did in the, in the long ago past as well. And so the eagle thing, we have an eagle from one of the sites in Mimbris. Um, there's a site in the Casas Grandes area, an important ritual site that has a water birds, wings of water birds, um, and a swan, a swan wing. You know, I mean, it's the middle of the stinking desert, and they have a swan wing. So somebody really wanted this stuff, um, and it's very powerful stuff. Um, oh. So anyway, um, birds are important. Were there turkeys raised in... Membranes. We don't find many turkey bones. There are some, uh, but we don't find many. Um, there are some from a site, a big, biggish classic site, way at the north end of the valley, and there are quite a few of them from that site, Elk Ridge, it's called. <laughs> but, and maybe, maybe we got turkey bones up there because it's farther north and it was a better place for turkeys to live. Um, I just don't know. But we don't find evidence of them raising them. Um, on the other hand, you know, turkeys can become pretty acclimated to people. And, you know, if you feed them a little bit, they, they come around. And so, in that sense, they might have been tending turkeys, um, you know, to get them to come around and then they could eat them or use them in ritual, um, the either reason, one. The reason why I was asking is because I had always wondered about because of um, the large amount of turkey raising in Pacume, I was always uh, considering mm -hmm. the idea of psittacosis as being a, a 
possible reason for some of the um, uh, demise of Pakimak. Uh, we have Paul Minnis here who has actually worked in that area. <laughs> I never thought of you as a turkey. We're married, so I can say that. Um, you, you want to take the turkey question? I, I, did, I, I, only got, I only got part of it. I mean, turkeys are interesting because we think they're, well, turkeys. <laughs> and if you contrast them with the macaws, you find almost the same number of turkey skeletons as macaw skeletons in Pakime. You find areas of turkey production, that is, pens, and they're about the same number as macaws. Turkeys don't seem to be eaten. They seem to have been used sacrificially, almost in the same numbers of macaws. And so on those basis, it appears that turkeys were probably to the people of Pakimei were as important as macaws, or certainly more important than we would tend to think when we'd make the contrast between these wonderful birds and these perhaps less than wonderful birds. <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I, wasn't, I, didn't get, I couldn't hear your full question, but I, is that... Is that What's that? You think about, and, and you think that that may have been an issue of Pakimei? Yeah. Well, except for a lot of the turkeys are buried in dedicatory offerings like some of the macaws. So it isn't as if they had a ma mass die off of different ages. They tended to have a very, the, the turkeys tended to be buried, not eaten and buried in certain contexts, uh, which suggest that they had some importance simply beyond what we would think about as Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay, and so I don't, I don't, I don't think so. In fact, I think if you're going to make that argument for turkeys, you make it for macaws in terms of mass die-off. But I think the, if you look at the the, dis, the distribution of their deposition, where the part of the people doing with them, it doesn't suggest to me that there was some sort of ma mass die-off. I bet the turkeys were in a lot better health, however, than the macaws. The macaws at Pocky May were not overly happy macaws, I think. Healthy, I, but we don't know. But interestingly, turkeys probably, one can make, make an argument, were, at, were exceptionally important in the very same way macaws were important, which is not the way we would look at macaws versus turkeys. Okay. Well, I think we'll call it a night. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you.